I'll see this actually in practice now. So if we click start, uh, yeah, because the reason I was just sitting there loading was not because it was taking a long time, it's because um, I think the service right now as it is, and we can go look in the source code, but I think the service as it is right now just panics on uh, API error. Uh, let's go take a look actually while we're waiting. It, it's not instant, right? It, it does take a minute to, uh, to get API results back. Uh, so handlers, complete chat, right? Uh, so probably what's going on here is that when we, yeah, we do log the response, um, but we do like an expect here on the await. Are we checking? Um, okay. So probably we get like a non 200 response code. Uh, in this call. All right, right, right. So I'm using a library that's wrapping, that's providing like functions to call the API called OpenAI Dive. And so this is probably going to, uh, yeah, okay. So we probably, I'm not gonna pull up the logs here because I don't know for sure that there's nothing secret in them. Um, but we're probably panicking right here. Hmm, interesting. Well, that's no good. Maybe... I don't know, we're still loading. Interesting. I wonder. Maybe it's taking a second for the uh, the billing information, like for the part that handles <laughs> the billing to connect to the API limit uh, part. Let's just try again. The other thing I can do is, uh... well anyway, this has really nothing to do with the, the thing we were working on which is all about um, the bulk episode creation. Uh, and I think that part is is done, right? So we, we are able to create episodes from the stream and they have the, the, the episode number. Uh, add series ID and order index to create. I mean, that that's, that's what we're doing here, sure. Uh, I mean, sometimes the uh, the copilot generate commit message is really great, but other times, yeah. Uh, add series ID and order index to bulk create episodes button, sure. I mean, that, that is essentially what we're doing here. Push that up. Does, does pushing this? Yeah, I thought it did, okay. Okay. Yeah, I usually use maybe the button down here or not that button. Okay. So I'm, oh, maybe. Let's do this. Let's restart the AI API. Four days ago. Well, maybe it's not panicking then, right? Because, well, regardless, I've restarted it. Let's give it one more try, just because I don't know that I've actually shown this working on stream. Uh, which is funny because, <laughs> because of the number of times I have used this, and then when I want to show it on stream, then it doesn't work. But that isn't that isn't that always how that is. All right. Anyway. Okay, this is quote unquote ready for review. <laughs> There's no one to review this. Uh, just enable auto merge. All right. 
right, 25, 25 files changed. And we ran through most of this already at the beginning of the stream. What did I change in here? Oh, adding some tracing. Sure, and error stuff. Oh, and I fixed the, um, this This was unrelated also <laughs> to what the, the PR is for. Um, but fixing the, why was this like this? Body that playlist position, unwrap or one. Right. So if you provide the playlist position, then we subtract one from it. If you don't, then we default to one and subtract one from it. So in other words, the playlist position as a API parameter here is one indexed, but the value provided to the, the YouTube slash Google API is zero indexed. And that's just to make it consistent so that, because like in the UI, it's gonna be one index. Like you're gonna show episode number one. You're not, well, maybe you could show episode number zero and maybe that would be appropriate for like a programming series. Um, and I guess I, I have seen, well, probably people with programming backgrounds, but still people doing episode zeros, but those are typically like, even for gameplay, those are like, not actual gameplay. That's like, oh, I'm gonna start a Rim, RimWorld series, and uh, episode zero is gonna be like, uh, setting up starting pawns and stuff or whatever, anyway. All right, so that merged, that's gone. Hey, look, so we got a response. It did eventually work. Um, and so what that looks like, if I expand this out, is that we get some JSON. Um, <laughs> We get, we get define instead of description. Okay, that's weird. And then, interesting, interesting. Okay. So we got some, we got some corruption here. <laughs> what is this? Okay, I've not seen, <clears throat> this This is kind of something I've not seen a lot of, uh, but that's interesting. Okay, not, not a good result this time uh, in a few different ways. Uh, so let's, uh, let's change the model. Actually, I think I had on stream, on, on, like on screen at one point, uh, literally the file that we needed to to change so right so it's in it's an AI API in complete chat there's just a string here GPT4 turbo um, for the model so what does the model need to be is it like GPT40 it could be um, hmm I had this pulled up at one point, but I don't still have it handy anymore. Let's see, GPT-40 API model. Models, here's the docs. Okay, I can show that. I'm kind of more leery now of, um, uh, Googling on stream. Uh, because Google likes to show random things, like my location. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so we just say the model GPT-40, and then that is currently alias to 2024.05.13. Okay, currently what I have is GPT-4 Turbo. Um, interesting. Turbo with vision capabilities. JSON mode and function calling. Apply cheap. It's cheaper and faster than GPT-4 Turbo. It's our most advanced model, they say. Accepting text or image inputs and outputting text. It's much more efficient. Mm-hmm. 
to paying customers, which I am. I, I just paid them another 10 bucks. There you go. Okay, so uh, I'm pretty sure what I just copied is literally the thing I already have. Okay. Uh, rebuild the container. Um, this is probably something where really what I should be doing is having an environment variable to feed in the model, maybe. Um, at least like how this service works right now, that probably probably makes sense. Um, like if I had different things that were wanting to use different models, then maybe that would stop making sense. Or maybe to have multiple environment variables. Yeah, let's let's do this. Let's open AI model. There we go. Uh, otherwise default to 3.5 turbo, how about not? Uh, we'll default to the thing we already want. And then app state is gonna read in, it's gonna we're gonna pass in that. Yeah, and then app state needs to be updated to also have open AI model. Yeah. And then apparently we are using, huh, why did I choose to do this? Why did I choose to use new and, hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ditch that whole idea of doing it that way. It's not a new. Um, my mind again. <laughs> uh, let's see. It... Hmm, open AI model string. Yeah. Everything's happy about that. And then in here, we're already reading state, right? So then, this is just state.openAI model. And then I'll just start another build. Um, hmm. And we do default, right? So even though we're mat missing this environment variable, we will have GPT 4.0. Uh, but now in Docker Compose, for the AI service, <laughs> what do you mean, DaVinci? GPT uh, 4 0. There we go. Alright, so now in the future, all I have to do is just change the Docker Compose. Uh, or, you know, if I was deploying this somewhere, change whatever setting the environment variable for the container uh, and restart the service. All right, cool. So, um, things are restarting. There we go. Uh, hmm. All right, so. If I open this chat widget and click start, uh, we should have already restarted at least once with the, the AI microservice. 
So it should already be using GPT-4. Now it's already failed, <laughs> but this is a pretty common failure mode where, uh, okay, interesting, interesting. Where it has wrapped the response in kind of a uh, markdown thing. I think I did say at the beginning of this that sometimes it does um, do this. Now the title and description, that part looks good. Catch me live on Twitch. And it even uses like little, uh, little uh, uh, thingies, <laughs> hashtags, <laughs> sections. It's trying really hard. Um, this is probably a thing where I need to change my prompts around a little bit too. Oh, and we're restarting again. All right, that, that whole thing's gone. Let's try again. Okay, that's that feels faster. And hey, this time we didn't get any, any decoration. It might even be valid JSON. Um, I'm gonna say no because, or it might be valid JSON, but it's missing things, right? Because there's supposed to be, um, additional keys in the object that have keywords and the like the chapter marks in a way that like the code is supposed to read that from the JSON and then build the description rather than having all of this in the description. Yeah, so like that's not parsable because that that's what uses message does. It parses the response as JSON. So I don't know if this is any worse, and it's definitely faster. Um, and I have resorted at times to just like copying this out myself and then doing this. Um, pretty cool. The title is almost exactly the same. It's just changed the capitalization. Uh, and then the description, let's take a look at that. So join me in this chill Sunday morning coding session as they continue to work on the glowing telegram project using Elixir. Um, in this episode, I delve into creating a Twitch chatbot using WebSockets. Uh, technically true, technically true. Uh, I mean, it, it does use WebSockets, the thing that it's, it's doing, yeah. Uh, follow along as I experiment with Elixir libraries, troubleshoot issues, integrate authentication for the bot. Whether you're an Elixir newbie or an exploring Twitch bot development, this video offers a practical and engaging coding experience. Recorded March 24, 2024. Might be true. I don't think I have that metadata. It must be pulling from the linked uh, stream, right? Yeah, yeah, that's in the prompt. Twitch channel. I don't know if this kind of markdown works for uh, YouTube descriptions uh, I was about to Google something <laughs> Hold on. Uh, YouTube video description markdown question mark huh tips for video description so writing your description. It's not surprising. YouTube, I don't think, really has an interest in <laughs> encouraging people to uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, what I might end up doing is make more like a template that has 
this kind of structured stuff in it. Huh, hold on. Did we get... No, no. So it had the timestamps embedded in the description still. Which is not how this is supposed to work. Like, if we look at the prompt, this is what the response is supposed to look like, where it has keywords and chapters. That's structured data coming back, and it's, it's not doing that. Uh, fortunately, the, the code that I have that's, that's parsing this just like kind of, okay, well, this is not there, so it doesn't do anything, so that, that's good. Uh, unfortunately, another issue right now, and the thing I probably want to change with the prompt is that the timestamps don't actually work because um, this is based off of looking at uh, the relative start and stop times of the episode and the timestamps in the original transcript. But if I change anything from the export at OTIO, like in DaVinci Resolve, if I adjust, if I change where the start or stop are, especially the start, right? Because then it offsets everything, then this is no longer correct. Now, maybe what that means is that my workflow needs to be finalizing edits and then generating the, the description and the timestamps and stuff. That's probably true anyway. Um, yeah, let's let's check the, the workflow. There we go, the, the card went over to done. I've, I have a lot more than seven things done on this project, but I did archive most everything. Um, overall workflow. So we create a stream, we ingest video. Epi episodization is, is, I've decided a word. Uh, review silence detection, rough periods from stream, episode record. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is the gap right here is, so what we're, what I'm, the workflow that I'm actually doing now is I'm, I'm working on this part and then I export OTIO and then render. And this workflow is more, I think what needs to eventually happen where we are, um, we, we have the silence detection and transcript stuff. And then it's select rough periods from stream based on collected metadata being an interactive timeline that shows silence this transcript in the chat. Uh, maybe with like thumbnails and stuff. I actually basing, basically having like a mini video editor in the UI to pick out interesting bits uh, and then create episodes from that and then summarize those sections uh, and then review sections and markers. So then kind of iterating through the, the essentially like cut selection process and then export those is, is the thought. I, I do have some thoughts about eventually instead, maybe, I don't know, I guess we could still export to resolve, but depending on what I wanna end up doing and kind of the complexity, maybe that's unnecessary, right? So if I, if I already have the cuts and I have predefined like intro, outro, overlay things, then maybe resolve is, is not necessary. And maybe I'm just using like FFmpeg and some other tooling to like embed that inside of this tool itself. I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, take the rendered thing and then finalize kind of the, the details for upload to YouTube and then all the upload stuff, right? Um, so a lot of the bit, the, the, like the parts of this are done, but kind of like figuring out some of the details still, figuring out how some of these things are gonna work, how they tie together, um, polishing, um, and then building a UI that supports doing all of this and kind of in a, in a workflow, especially in a workflow that is, um, that feels like it keeps, it keeps you on track of what you need to do <laughs> and you can come back to it uh, is something I need to figure out how that how that's going to work. Like I was talking about before with the AI stuff, being able to have kind of that iterative chat experience, 
but not have it be like a modal where you have to do it here. And then when you navigate away or refresh, it goes away. You want something that is more long lasting, like a persistent session, um, potentially. And being able to like tune things or remove things from the context also can be good. Um, yeah. So typically what I'm doing right now is I'm just removing the chapter stuff because it, um, because of the way I'm doing things anyway, I think even with the UI, the way it is here, if I were to like render out the video and then come back to the episode, select the file and then adjust the track mark to be like, okay, actually it starts seven minutes in to the stream and then use this. Like if I change the start, here, let's, let's take a look at this really quick. So like here in this bit, see, it says, all right, just about ready to get started here. Uh, something, something, something. So this is zero seconds, but this is not zero seconds into the stream. This is zero seconds from when the episode starts, I think. Uh, so if I were to clear this and close this, and I were to change this time like that and click chat, uh, I'm a liar. <laughs> uh, clear? Huh, interesting. Maybe I would need to save this. I don't want to do that. Huh, I, I should check on that because that should... Hey, Ninja Juice. Good morning. It's going pretty good. Just trying to figure out some stuff. And, uh, you know, trying out the new uh, GPT-4.0, uh, 4 Omni uh, model for uh, generating descriptions for episodes going up onto YouTube. Oh, hey, Bayless is here. <laughs> 110. Brainless Society just subscribed for six months. 110. Uh, it's okay. So that's six months, yeah? Zero, <laughs> one, one, zero, one, one. One, zero, zero. One, zero, one. One, one, zero. Six months, yep. It took me a couple of seconds. morning brainless <laughs> and thank you for the resub all right lost my train of thought train of thought was about whether in the UI the chat dialogue component will get its context updated. Uh, context is just a prop, right? So this should re-render. Base messages. Oh. Probably not because we're stuffing the base messages into the state. Messages slice, set messages. So, right. So handle clear doesn't reread base messages. It mutates, it, it takes whatever is in the state and updates it. Why would we do that? Why wouldn't we just take base messages and be like, hey, here we go. Right. So then I might have to refresh here. It's kind of hit or miss what uh, uh, V will refresh. So I hit chat now. Huh. 
Uh, I'm beginning to think that I'm not actually using the tracks information to populate the context here, uh, which is uh, that actually <laughs> is a better explanation of why things are not working right. Okay, so where are we using chat dialog? Control Shift F chat dialog in chat button, but that's just pass through, right? We're passing through the transcript for chat button to the transcript here. Okay, so what uses chat button? Edit, reads transcript. Okay. So yeah, currently in the episode edit um, component, I just am, this is, this is where the prompt is right now. Uh, so transcript is just, we filter based on this function, transcript segments, uh, segment overlaps. Segment overlap, segment record, record. Okay, I see. So I think, I think maybe that I would actually have to save this. It was, it was five before, right? Let's just double check that. I wanna test this out to see if this actually works the way I think it works. So if I change this to 22, temporarily, right? When I go to chat, there we go. Now the transcript updates, right? So the zero second mark for the episode is based off of uh, whatever I was saying, 22 minutes into the video, into the stream. No. So if I click chat again, then that changes. Okay, okay, that's good. So what I, what I probably need to start doing then is after I export the episodes with, to OTIO and import it into Resolve, if I need to move the start of the video at all, uh, it's unfortunately really annoying. It's hard to keep track of because what will be in DaVinci Resolve will be the video will start five minutes in, like the beginning of the timeline will be five minutes, two seconds and 400 milliseconds in give or take because it's frame you know whatever frame it is um and then i would need to keep track of if i trimmed off anything more how much more i trimmed and add that to this amount and then at that point i can save the record hit chat and then the transcript for the prompt would start at the same point and would align with what was edited. And then that point, assuming it did successfully create the chapter uh, timestamp marks, then I could actually publish that. And those would hopefully align with what happened in the video, which is what the goal is. Okay. Um, I think at this point, one, one other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove this no, I'll leave the number. I'll leave the number. That's kind of like number of episodes there are, 58. Yeah, we're up to episode 58 uh, as of, you know, 324. So here are all of the episodes that I've created that I have not published yet. I need to go and render them out, uh, which is still not, unfortunately, just like clicking and waiting. There's still some stuff I do in DaVinci Resolve that I've not automated yet around adjusting audio levels, especially during the, the outro and getting things lined up and um, yeah, occasionally adjusting things a bit. Okay, but for now, I think it is 
Well, we'll go with, go with GPC 4.0. It is cheaper and faster, and it doesn't seem necessarily worse. So good enough for me. All right, so what I did was I added this environment variable to the Docker Compose, and I threaded that through the AI API and defaulted to GPT-40 just to have a default and threaded that all the way to where we're providing the model to uh, OpenAI Dive, which is the crate that's uh, providing a, a Rust API for OpenAI's API. And then a chat dialog, I made it so that I think this is fine. Uh, Neovim 0.10 was recently released and includes inline hints. Neat feature, I was checking some Rusco yesterday with that. Inline, oh yeah, so like, um, Do I have an example? I like it. so the, this sort of thing, where the actual text here is just pipe app pipe, and then it injects like what the type is. Exactly. All right. I'm tracking. I'm tracking. All right. So push that branch up. Unfortunately, <laughs> there there's a lot of inertia behind me using VS Code, and. I don't know. I don't know what it would take to convince me to switch to something else now. Oh, is there two spaces there? I I almost panicked for a mo moment because I uh, I knocked over my coffee glass, but both fortunately and unfortunately, it was empty. <laughs> I mean, fortunately, because I now don't have to mop up a, a bunch of coffee off of my uh, my pad that's on my desk. And uh, unfortunately, because my coffee cup is empty, there's just a drop left. And now there's not. All right, so that will auto merge here in a minute. Now what are we doing? I could go back to working on the Twitch chat bot. Did we have tasks on this? Like things I wanted to do? Nope. <laughs> Is there a PR? Hmm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I was doing that in Elixir. I have to change the uh, tags on the stream. But I could work on this. Yeah, yeah. Fix Twitch chat message parsing. Connect to Redis. Don't attempt to connect to Twitch if auth token isn't present. Connect to what's since available. Add ability to send the bot the auth token. What does that mean? Create service that owns the refresh token and sends out updated auth token. Store Twitch messages in Redis. I don't I don't even remember. I don't even remember what we were doing. Um, I need to give Gleam a try. Syntax is a mixture of, an, of Elixir and Rust. I, I've seen something about Gleam. Um, not really, I don't think I've really looked at it. First result is Gleam.io, which is a marketing app, apparently. Second result is Gleam.run. So the first issue, yeah, I think I've seen this. First issue is they, it's very bright. <laughs> uh, hold on, let me, here, 
balance this out. There we go. Gleam is a friendly, a friendly language for building type safe systems that scale. Does this one do it? Ah, oh, see, <laughs> this one needs to be animated too. Anyway, superficial concerns. Import Gleam IO, pub fun, main IO print LN. Sure, sure. Is this, is this like, yeah, pipe in greater than, yeah. So we have like a threading. I mean, we're spawning task, yeah. Uh, so it's Erlang VM, yep. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, that reminds me of Rust. Multilingual. Makes it easy to use code written in other Bean languages like Erlang and Elixir. Okay. You're still here. <laughs> Language tour. Yeah, I think I've seen this. I'm not going to uh, <laughs> uh, dive into that right now. I'm not even sure. Um, I, like the Twitch bot thing is a thing I, I do want to do. It's just has not been a priority. Uh, maybe maybe that can be a next stream thing. Yeah. What else do we got? All right, that, that PR got merged. We could add YouTube category and other settings to the series. Did I, nope, I didn't make any notes about what other things might be. Uh, mm, excuse me. Uh, tasks can have additional follow-on tasks. That was that other PR that's open, uh, wherever it went. Allow for multiple chain tasks. We had some errors, but otherwise, like I think the task worker was kind of there, right? If there's the next task, then we spawn that next task continue on right as long as we can like satisfy these errors <laughs> then uh, I think this is kind of working task worker queues next task so it's almost done task API supports next task right so being able to call the API and tell it what the next task is update the task UI to show info about the next task uh, is kind of more interesting. Um, and I do have, like there are use cases for this around, hmm. at least there was a use case, right? So the use case was around being able to upload a video to YouTube. And then once the video is uploaded, then going and adding it to a playlist. But the playlist stuff was just added to the API endpoint that uploaded the video. But there are other cases where we want to like do multiple separate things, um, like call multiple endpoints and pass the result from one thing to the other and like have that kind of orchestration. I don't, I don't know that I have a use case for this right now though, like a thing that I need this for. 
Now I do have another thing on the backlog. Make a higher level API for, uh, for asking for JSON results with a specific schema from GPT so that it can be validated and can call back to ask for corrected results. Use task API. So, but I don't know, I don't know that this immediately calls for that other functionality. Um, Like the other functionality is about building up a set of tasks that are chained together, but you know what those tasks are in advance. Like you have to know the chain of things you want to do before you kick, th kick things off. Whereas if it was more of a conditional sort of thing, that might be something interesting, kind of a more complex uh, task orchestration might be valuable. Um, so, higher level API for asking for JSON results, right? So right now, the API that we have, yeah, let's go back to, let me check out pane now that everything's merged. And the AI API, so this endpoint is called directly, right, from the front end. Uh, I mean, through Nginx, etc. But it's just the HTTP endpoint. It's not going through the tasking process. It's not asynchronous. Um, maybe this is the point where I need to start thinking about kind of that asynchronous AI chat workflow stuff, where we create like a session. Um, maybe. Hmm. I wonder. Um, when we... So chat message, is that something I've defined? No, that's coming from there. When was the last time I opened, uh, updated OpenAI Dive? And have there been changes? Let's go crates.io. Updated. 11 days ago. So create chat completion. Ooh, actually, what, what is this function calling? In an API call, you can describe function and have the model intelligently choose. Let's make this bigger. For the stream. You can choose to output a JSON object containing arguments to call one or many functions. The chat completions API does not call the function. Instead, the model generates JSON that you can use to call the function in your code. Uh, let's see. Now, the, the text is just cut off here, unfortunately. There you go. Uh, let's see. So, chat completion parameters. Um, Oh, I see they're, they're looking up that there rather than using string. Sure, sure, sure. Tools. Some vec chat completion tool type function. Function is, give it a name, a description, parameters. Interesting. Maybe, maybe this does the thing I need to do. Get random number. Content, give me a random number between 100 and no more than 150. Can you tell it about a tool? Get random number. Get a random number between two values. And then is that all you need to do? Um, and then you 
get the message from the first choice. And then you look to see if there's a tool call. For each tool call, you check to see if it's the thing. And then you're capturing the JSON there. Okay, so I, I think I understand. And we could go look at the open AI, uh, open AI API docs. Um, but what I'm inferring from this is something that I think will be good. Um, point also has stream support, it's interesting. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> it doesn't actually show the API key. Uh, Lots of parameters that I'm not using. Response format. Ooh. So this is a thing I'm, I'm missing out on. When using JSON mode. also instruct the model to produce JSON yourself via system or user message. Okay. Now, maybe that's what I want to, maybe this also solves what I'm trying to do, right? So. I'm thinking about two different things here. One is I provide some kind of tool. Let's see if I can find, there we go, tools. A list of tools the model may call. Currently only functions are supported as a tool. Use this to provide a list of functions the model may generate JSON inputs for. A max of 128 functions are supported. Now it seems to me that tools is more powerful because you can you can explicitly define the the parameters right you can use json schema right to define the shape of json so what i'm thinking here is that in the prompt Uh, which I, uh, is in the front end. What we can do, what is it, chat button? No, no, it's it's defined in uh, episodes edit. Here we go. So it defines this job and this context and maybe Maybe what I want to do is just allow the front end to pass that tool definition stuff uh, to the back end API and just have this as kind of a pass through right now, which is effectively what it's doing, right? It is, we're taking parameters. Parameters is just whatever messages are from the payload and we're just mapping. We're translating simple chat message, the struct into chat message from OpenAI Dive and just proxying the request essentially. Uh, and maybe for now, that's fine. I mean, maybe, I don't know that I have a use case where the session needs to be multi-user or like go across multiple browsers. So maybe it could be front end only and just like the state could live in in you know in the front end. Uh, but persisted, maybe locally. That could be an option. Or it could be, you know, in the back end in, in Redis or Postgres or something. Um, also, I don't know. That I have this is why I'm not building the end tool. I'm building like this admin interface and building all these things piecemeal. I don't know how it's all gonna come together. I wanna just figure out uh, what what's gonna work. 
Um, but so anyway, so the idea here is maybe we define a tool, and the tool is a thing to generate the um, YouTube video metadata, right? And then I rephrase the prompt to be like, use this, t you know, to, to generate this metadata from this information so that it is keyed off to use this tool and it, it's keyed off to provide the appropriate inputs that I'm able to define the exact shape. But there isn't really a, I mean, the tool is just the front end of this app, right? Where it feeds back the JSON that can then be captured. All right, so on that on that thought, I'm gonna take a break here, maybe I'll stretch my legs, and get some more water, and I'll be back in just a couple of, a couple of minutes, and uh, we'll see if we can do all this. BRB.